Barney, I wanted to ask, um, and thank you for that, that was incredibly rich, as all were, really, just extraordinary. Um, to what extent do you see the reemergence of psy psychoanalytic frames of reference in the 1980s to be, as I thought perhaps you were suggesting, um, in some sense, a product of the inversion of 1986 in 19, uh, 1968 in 1986, um, and um, and a way to think through again, in a admittedly different guise, the um, social and political provocations of somebody like Norman O. Brown or even Reich or Marcuse, um, and um, and to, as it were, correct that account for its certain inattentions, but of a piece with it. Hmm, that's interesting. I wasn't necessarily, well, I wasn't meaning all of that. I mean, in, in your response is interesting because I hadn't thought those thoughts. But I suppose I felt that it Well, I don't. I have to. I have to be a little personal here, but I wasn't coming from there myself. I was very much involved um, in Marxist formalist debate. So, in some ways, my res initial resistance to psychoanalysis was was from that perspective. I wasn't particularly a kind of sociological feminist, but I was very, very involved in those kinds of debates around materialism and so on. So it, I had, as a student, read some of those rather more kind of libertarian and rather more celebratory accounts um, of Eros and been fairly put off by that. So this, in a way, was a moment for me of recognition of something and actually a moment of recognition where Marx and Freud could obviously come together because there was this joint deconstruction of human unhappiness. And I think that was very simple. You know, it, it wasn't complicated, but it was a way in which they could not simply be resolved in any way, but that became productive. And I remember asking Peter Wallen when he gave a talk once, when I was still very resistant to, you know, the, why was Freud everywhere? This was very early on. And he just said this very simple thing that actually was, I mean, I don't like, I wasn't converted, but I was taken. He just said, well, it's totally inadequate, but it's the best set of tools on offer. What other theory of sexuality would you find? kind of, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It just opened a way of thinking. It seems hard to kind of, you know, find that again. But I think those fundamental questions, you know, part of our problem now with the, you know, so-called exhaustion of, you know, say, psychoanalysis, which in, in many ways, I, I, you know, I, I can see, and a lack of kind of... Uh, you know, in the general culture, a feeling of it being exhausted, not least voiced by psychoanalysts themselves in many cases, but that in some ways it is these fundamental ways of thinking about the kinds of drives within the culture, exactly the kinds of drives that Mignon was talking about, that is what makes it seem so kind of necessary. And how on earth could you think it not. So I, I felt that very strongly listening to Mignon's talk. Um, I was really interested in uh, what you were raising around exhaustion alongside what um, Hal Foster uh, was raising around um, fatigue. Um, and I've, I suppose I've been around long enough now that um, I begin to be very alert when exhaustion and fatigue, um, exhaustion with the subject, exhaustion with psychoanalysis, um, fatigue with critique, um, begin to be um, analyzed, made symptomatic in some sense, because it seems to me that 
it is often part of the process by which those, um, those tools, as you're calling them, are removed um, and replaced by, say, weapons, as in the case of the, the Latour text that, that Hal was talking about. The, the kind of machinery of that text is very much one of uh, weapons, the, the arsenal of uh, academe, you know, uh, where is our DARFA, where are our, you know, um, flying uh, insects with um, the capacity to destroy the enemy and all this kind of thing. So there is a, a sense in which, um, for me, the displacement of critical tools and intellectual traditions by serviceable weapons for the current situation is often also um, bound up with a um, kind of transmutation of debate, the thing that we're involved with, into war, the thing that we've also um, been hearing about where um, culture becomes war, where um, the, uh, the parties become enemies rather than antagonists in a um, discursive field. So for me, um, when something is exhausted, if psychoanalysis is exhausted, then that would be more acceptable if violence were exhausted um, alongside it. Um, but to remove the, uh, the analytical tools and the intellectual traditions that have been uh, developed to, to try to think about things, while those things are dominating your life, um, seems rather peculiar, but it is not unusual. So I really appreciated the, the way that you developed that in uh, the discussion of, um, of Jacqueline Rose's work, and she's, of course, done a great deal of work on, on war and tracking that back to um, this, this moment of the, the early 80s when it was another war moment in a, in a sense. Um, thank you for all three presentations. I, th I too thought they were extraordinary. I just wanted to say one thing to follow up on what Mignon just said. I mean, there is a moment where we are in it <clears throat> when the humanities are asked to deliver deliverables. I mean, that's the term that's now used. You, we must show um, what we deliver in terms of instrumentality, essentially. Uh, and I, I think it's very, very crucial to insist on methods, not as weapons, but as, I mean, maybe tools is too aggressive, but uh, any way that we can push back on this um, absolute call for the instrumental use value of what we do. But I, I do think that your, the text that you selected, um, maybe not David so much, but Mignon and, and Bryony also are involved in a um, a discourse of failure, if not fatigue, and importantly so. But I, uh, you know, the, the extraordinary thing about the Rose text is that it does reanimate a moment. For me, it's almost the last moment of the avant garde, where there, where Marx and Freud are still in conversation. I mean, it's it's conversation that's about to end, but through a feminist engagement of psychoanalysis, the, the, the demand for psychic transformation, subjective transformation um, in the Freudian project is still in touch with the demand for social revolution in the Marxian project. And that, that's so crucial to the avant-garde that to uh, put those two demands in play, uh, and it, it seems so difficult now and I wonder if, if, even though I'm very sympathetic to the way in which these texts uh, highlight the productivity of failure. I mean, for me, in the Bersani text, I've, I've always loved this line where he says, the moment of theoretical collapse in Freud, and you can, I think, put in other proper names there, the moments of theoretical collapse in Freud are inseparable from what I will risk calling truth. He says psychoanalytical truth. There's a way in which we have come to fetishize failure a bit because it, it seems um, 
to offer a resistance to the, the will to the, the subject, the will to authority uh, that so many of us here seem to want to question. But I think it, it also opened up a certain celebration of the failed, of the melancholic, of the abject, of the traumatic, um, that makes that moment when Marx and Freud could still be in conversation seem very distant now. So it's very difficult to imagine how one proposes a, a new construction for the subjective and the social. Uh, and that was still a possibility uh, in the, the moments that, at least of the, the Rose text. I mean, it, Brian, as you say, it's mostly retrospective. Yeah, I too was taken back to a moment that I certainly regret its passing when exactly that dialogue that uh, Hal was talking about and that Brian invoked uh, was still possible where, you know, the psychic, the microcosm of the larger social order was one place where, uh, you know, the violence of ideology was staged and that therefore you could map the one set of terms on to the other from Freud to Marx. And this was at least, you know, in uh, amongst enough people um, a common body of knowledge. And you could introduce judiciously a bit of Freud where appropriate, uh, or maybe a good chunk of Freud or a good chunk of Marx where appropriate, and not necessarily be a Marxist or not be a Freudian by virtue of doing so, because it belonged to a common storehouse of analytical tools uh, that um, that worked, you know, that the, the and the, the their truth value lay in the in the ability one had to deploy them persuasively. But you know, psycho well, Marxism it almost goes without saying was violently discredited and displaced from the academy. Uh, and you know, the the date uh, we've. We've uh, evoked a number of dates, but the date, 1979, 1980, the advent of the Thatcher government and uh, the Reagan administration, uh, the ending of, you know, at least the, the rather, uh, you know, ineffectual but still, you know, viable social democracy that the Callahan and Carter governments had held on to, and, and then the virtual extinction of that which of course coincides, it's, it's a sort of midpoint between the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the art historical innovations, the dates of those innovations and clusters that we've been talking about. Uh, but for Freud, it was, you know, it didn't just get exhausted, it was attacked and rooted out. Here in this country, the New York Review of Books, for some reason, decided it was going to extirpate Freudianism as a viable academic discourse and set this clownish Frederick Cruz, an English professor, uh, to do the job. And just one piece after another, after another. And then there was another group of these professional uh, Freudian uh, gadflies who circulated around and, you know, said scandalous things about Freud as a person, you know, which and I can remember it so vividly. Uh, and however specious and, and really unpersuasive all of this stuff was, it was just such a relentless campaign that in the end, you know, you couldn't use psychoanalytic terminology in, uh, I'm tempted to say, the normal way that we could use it before. And we found our storehouse of ideas and thinking really impoverished as a result of this. You can still come back and try to do it, and Jacqueline Rose is doing it in that piece, and a number of other stalwarts are trying to do it, but it, it had its, its effective audience taken away. And I think we need, you know, in these, you know, these ideas we're talking about here did have some consequence. The Open University has the honor of being overtly attacked by the Thatcher government. Uh, for its, its, its first course, first really uh, substantial body of course material, uh, which I think we should remember with, uh, with uh, you know, honorific recognition.
this, this is just very quick. Um, I think this is really important to underscore that this age that we thought was one of critical theory, uh, and it was, and might still be, but is much more profoundly the age of Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism. I mean, and if you go to the Cindy Sherman retrospective in New York right now, you will see a generation, and she is exactly, well, she's a year older than I am, uh, a, a generation uh, whose story is told there, even though we, al we always thought that her work was anti-biographical, had nothing to do with the historical. But there, there is a way in which, just in the trajectory of the work from the, the early un, untitled film stills, the ingenue, you know, fresh to New York, to the, uh, the, the women who have achieved great status through neoliberalism, essentially. And there, there is an extraordinary account there of what happened to our, I mean, generation is too broad a term, but certainly to our cohort. I mean, there is a real historical allegory in that work. You know, we started off, we thought we were the, the kind of late, late legatees of this last avant-garde of critical theory. But we turned out to be the, the children, really the children of Thatcher and Reagan. I wanted to take a, a slightly dissenting tack, I know it's gonna be a surprise, um, and, and just worry a little bit over um, what Minion noted, which was Bersani's um, identification of destruction and love. Um, and to think about that both in terms of, for example, Freud, right, for whom, you know, it's still, I think you'll probably agree, a little unsettled whether there's a dual instinct theory, eros and thanatos, or, or, or not. Um, because at different levels, at different points, Freud seems to be pointing in different directions. But, but that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is instead what it means to relocate the battleground at this historical moment from the social field to the psychic. And whether that relocation taking place at the moment of Foucault's ascendancy is itself a reaction formation. Okay, thank you for the question, and now I'm going to answer something different because, um, I mean, I, th I think what you've said is extremely interesting, um, but for me, um, it, it's, it's useful just to go back a little ways in the discussion um, that, that's been developing here to um, what Hal asked about in terms of um, the kind of fetishization of failure in Bersani and the um, notion of collapse into, into opposites and kind of um, think about these two texts, the, the Rose text that Brian spoke about and the Brissani that I spoke about and their um, differences as well as in the ways in which they participate in a common culture in that moment. Because um, for me at least, um, with Jacqueline Rose, what's important about failure is to um, articulate the, the social and psychical fields pretty closely. Um, so it's not so much a displacement of one to the other, but think of these as, as overlapping. And think about um, failure, get comfortable with it, okay? Because it is structural to who we are. So the failure of identity, um, which she's talking about there specifically, is um, um, that is structural to um, the, as the unconscious is, is structural to who we are, and it, it's kind of what binds the social and the psychical together. Um, in, in Bersani, it seems to me that there's a way in which um, failure becomes a bit more of a value. And the, the reason that I quoted the, the little pieces that I did is really to, um, is to question, not this in its moment, but how this plays out, this sort of, um, excitement about the collapse into, into opposites and, and the failure of theory to stand up and how that um, plays out over time um, is, is for me um, genuinely a question. So when I said, you know, um, identical, how many times 
are things made to be identical in that text. Um, it's very, I, I was concerned about it as a reader. By the end of the text, the thing that really interested me is, um, with apologies to those of you who haven't read it, but I'll just be very brief about this, the way in which um, the individual superego and the cultural superego, uh, he does not want them to be identical. And uh, so this is the point at which it's not fun anymore for things to be identical. Um, and that seemed to me to be worth thinking about in, in terms of anticipating what's going to unfold, you know, how this text um, begins to be useful for us the, um, retrospectively. Because the, the point that he, he ends on of this uncertainty about the relationship in Freud, but also for him, of uh, individual and social subjectivity kind of turns on this question of this um, uh, moralizing violent individual superego and then what does that mean for the cultural superego? They mustn't be identical. So that's not really answering your question, but it, <coughs> I hope it's in the area. It's helpful. I, 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 maybe this is a follow-up to that. I, I, I always love Regine Bersani and I love this text in particular because of the way it deeply unsettles kind of just fundamental assumptions that we have about what we, what we, what we think and how we practice. And, and so in many ways, I see his reading of Freud commensurate with Derrida's reading of Marx in the sense that they're both attempts to kind of um, uh, isolate um, what might be considered a post-structuralist uh, core to their practice, the kind of de endless deferment, the spectral deferment of Marx's theory, or as you, you know, the kind of the essential failure to cohere um, the, the subject to cohere in Freud. Um, and again, I mean, I, I, these texts I, I find so powerful as models. Um, and yet, I, I, to bring in a Marxist term, I, I, I'm concerned about a kind of non-synchronous development. That is to say, that we, you know, to, to write like this or to think like this in a world where the kind of world posited in civilization and its discontent still exists, where meaning is still being solidified and, and marshaled in the name of violence. You know, I, I, it seems that it, it, it presents two models, whereas the, the intellectual work is projecting a, kind of almost like a future idealistic utopia. This is, if, if we thought this way, and if our thought was enacted materially this way, violence perhaps would wither away, right? But alas, as we're thinking this way, um, you know, to bring in Jonathan's example, right? As we as we posit the death of the author, right? Um, there are people who are being denied authority. Um, uh, you know, in Algeria, to use a specific example of Foucault. So it, I, I just bring up you know this idea idea that there's a certain kind of non-synchronicity between the the future we posit and the reality that um, we're positing again and again to suggest that perhaps. I, I'm not. I, I think there's a certain value that that is what we value in art. In some ways, is, is to imagine what is not imaginable. But in terms of its critical valence, I guess that's where I I, I, I'm, I have I get sad. I just wanted to say one or two things because I think, in terms of our endeavour to chart something about what happened. Hal's point about this being a last moment in, in some way, um, where this kind of nexus, this possibility seems no longer to be possible afterwards, this kind of conversation between feminism and, and Marxism, that a last moment of the oven, I think that's very important. And I think if we're historicizing this, period, then that, that's got to be one kind of pivotal point. But I also think it, what this moment represents is absolutely not an ending. So the different aspects of this word failure, I don't think we should be, I don't want to be a tragedian about failure because of course failure is generative. Failure is absolutely generative. It is a form of realism, if you like, because that is what it's like. And therefore, I think, for me, out of these two texts, in some ways, between Bassani and, and Rose, anyway, Bassani offers a, a way forward in a, 
an interesting way that's slightly kind of off piste perhaps from the debate so far that we're having or the conversation that we're having, having insofar as he makes very vivid a relationship to writing. And this relationship between Freud and Mallarmé, or, you know, the, the, the relation of theory to the literary is so fundamental and the way in which some of us have found that the direction that thinking psychoanalytically took us was actually away from the historical project and towards another kind of project. So in some ways, I think these differences, my project, <laughs> some of our project, an incomplete project for sure, but not, I mean, I'm interested in I guess, trying to figure out another way of thinking about the work that the artwork does, that the, I know other people have talked about this, but rather than, you know, that the, the, the artwork can itself pose the questions. So in some ways that the artwork works theoretically. And so in some ways, rather than you know, and writing is one of the few tools that we have. Um, I'm not, sorry, I didn't say that very well, but what I'm suggesting is that the historical project and how to do it better is not necessarily the only project that we are involved in. Can I ask you to clarify, because I'm just not getting how that is not a historical project. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> But it's not, I think, I think it is important to register the differences in how we think about history. You know, I'm the most consensual person. I would love us all to agree about what this historical project is, but I know before we begin that we absolutely don't. I wanted to, um, to bring in the Mercer text a bit here. Um, I wonder if there's anyone else here who thinks, as I do, that Mercer is actually doing what Roses and, and maybe Bersani are proposing. And what, what, what I mean by that is that through the interpret, this incredible interpretation of Maplethorpe's erotic photos of black men, which is what the topic for those who haven't read the, the, the Mercer text, there's this inc incredible uh, reading, I thought, um, of that goes from this is how I'm supposed to read these images into wait, I'm acknowledging my actual feelings about these images. This role that I'm supposed to play as critic doesn't quite fit. In other words, this rose idea of y using as a critical impulse the, the personal, real recognition that you don't fit the social role that you are supposed to as a critical impulse to think, which is exactly what Mercer does with these photos, and then starts to question and think, well, I have these erotic feelings about these images, and you know, how does that comport with my politics? You know, and, 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 and then he turns it into this occasion to really re think about, well, maybe these images, maybe I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, is thinking about mastery and the image and, and my role and how the object and the identification are, are it's complicated and, and, um, and ultimately comes up with a very, um, you know, uh, I don't know, is it counter-hegemonic? I don't, I, what's the word? It, it, interpretation, which I found is doing exactly what these other theorists are suggesting. Yeah, it seems as though that um, in disidentifying with the ideological self that is expected of him culturally, he is disidentifying with the critical self as well. And, you know, reformulating, recycling, these are the words of Munoz, um, what it is to be a critic, what it is to be a subject. And to go back to what I was trying to suggest earlier, this seems to me very much um, uh, the utility of psychoanalysis towards a new kind of historical project, a way of, of finding one's way to ask the different kinds of questions. But it does seem to me that 
one might not want to stop at framing this as a psychoanalytic project, but to understand instead that as a new kind of historical project. The, the, the reason why I uh, drew upon the Mercer was particularly because he plays maybe two roles in this. One is that he affirms the role of criticism. I mean, the essay that he wrote in 1989 that was kind of the, the setup for the 1991 review, he actually says the role of criticism in this work is that it resists such closures as my first reading was. Um, and in the second way, he affirms that there can be a death of the author um, in its recognition of the importance of the audience as a reader. At the same time, that he doesn't grant himself this overarching privilege to designate what the text means. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily a both and, I want to have it both ways, but I do think it recognizes the complexity, not only of the text that he's dealing with, but the idea of dealing with subjectivity at the moment when to, to Jonathan's issue that people were dying, but he doesn't, I think, want to throw away the very important critical theoretical work that went into thinking about how those same subjects were occluded to begin with. Yeah, can I, uh, my uh, sort of responses here, which are fairly primitive in some ways, I suppose, but one thing that I, I, I did notice is that um, in, in uh, I think that, that runs through both the, the Bassani text and the Mercer one, is this, this uh, sort of meditations on the question of the rational and the cognitive, and you know the, the way in which the, the Bassani text um, talks about um, psychoanalysis as a kind of um, meditation on the very threat to thinking and th those kinds of issues, and then and the, the Mercer one, which, as you say, is this sort of extraordinarily powerful, um, self-reflexive kind of meditation on on on, on looking and. Um, how you sort of deal with that. It, 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 you have a kind of, then what jumped out to me was a very sudden sort of change of gear about halfway through that text, which is like a kind of parenthesis almost, where um, the, the, the discussion goes away from the Maplethorpe photographs into the genre of the nude and the Western canon. And this immediately starts to speak to sort of contemporary um, you know, sort of post-colonial debates, ethnographic things about globalization and so on and so forth. And th th this kind of sudden sort of whiz from particularity and self-reflexivity to a curious kind of massification of, 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 of what he didn't like. Um, that's something which seems to me to be a, a continual problem that, that, that we, we have, that we're, we're, we are sort of hyper-reflexive, um, hyper-self-conscious about difference and distinction and so forth. And then the things that we don't like all get put into one sort of big, you know, lump together. And, and I th it's, it's very curious how this, this just sort of flies around from uh, one set of texts to another because it, it, it slightly goes to the Berm text that we, we had last night and the relationship of that to, um, you know, sort of difference between that and sociorean linguistic analysis. Um, it goes through to the, the question that came up earlier on about the, the relationship of the 18th century to the, these debates about contemporaneity because of, the, you know, the um, Mercer talks uh, specifically um, takes to task Kant and Hegel. Uh, as, as, as kind of fountainheads of a kind of discriminatory sense of, 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 of culture and identity, which he's fighting against. So the, the way in which these things sort of fly apart and come together and then sort of fly off in different directions, I think is one of the, 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 the most, um, you know, the most difficult points to get hold of, but also one of the most crucial. Put that very badly, I think, but... Anybody I'm ignoring here while I take advantage of the uh, unaccustomed lull in the, in the discussion? Uh, I just thought it might be good to bring back, uh, for the benefit of, of today's audience, something that emerged in the discussion over, we had over dinner last night, uh, apropos of, of Mapplethorpe's photographs, and of course thinking about the Colina Mercer article. 
Uh, and that is the rather extraordinary appearance of Patti Smith's memoir, Just Kids, of, well, of like the, the last two years or so, um, where uh, in the voice of an artist writing as an artist, uh, you know, there is an insight, an, an intimate kind of contact with the formation of Mapplethorpe's artistic project, you know, in all of its uh, human complexity and frailty and strength combined, that uh, maybe not be, it may not be history per se, but it is certainly what future historians will be using as, as primary material to evoke a certain subjectivity. Uh, it makes me think, too, of, of Howe's talking in our last session about the emergence of the viewer or the spectator as, a, uh, as an actor or subject in art history, which is very often based on texts that are cognate to Patti Smith's memoir. Uh, that is, literary texts, texts that produce... Uh, uh, you know, phantasms or figments of personae in a, a particular historical period on which a great deal of social history is made to rest. I mean, if you go back to a kind of founding moment, uh, Tim Clark's image of the people and its, its fundamental thesis that these big paintings in the Salon of 1851 by Courbet spoke past the bourgeois gatekeepers to, you know, the raw, threatening peasantry, and then you try to find what this actually rests upon, and it's one satirical pamphlet describing a, uh, a sort of stage peasant sitting on the bench of the salon and, and, and appreciating or getting Courbet in a way that no one else was doing, and it was plainly not, uh, not a you know, a, a bit of, of uh, uh, straightforward reportage. It was a projection on the part of a hostile reviewer, which by virtue of psychoanalytic, you know, reading uh, against the grain, one is then entitled to take as having some sort of, uh, uh, you know, correspondence to, to actual class conflicts. And I don't, you know, there's nothing at all to be disputed about this move, when it was taken, the effects it produced. But you also have to look at how fragile, you know, and how reliant upon uh, on myth that this kind of social history uh, uh, entailed. And so, you know, the, where the history lies vis-a-vis the more f figural uh, apprehension of experience, both in the past and in the present, is one you know that you have to continually be vigilant about, but also be willing to just ride it, you know, just go with it, uh, because you're not going to find better materials, and you'll get nowhere unless you have a you know a certain audacity, you know, in being able to use these things, which Clark, of course, possessed at that point. I'm going to say one thing about Just Kids because I think it gets us back to our moment or period under discussion and the, the conflicts and stakes there. You know, I love the music, I'm interested in the photographs, hated the book. Uh, because it represented, for me, uh, a commitment to a very old romantic idea of the artist, romantic idea of the self. I mean, Patti Smith and Robert Mapplethorpe come to New York as you know, late Rambodians. This is what I said last night. And there's this one extraordinary moment. I mean, she, Patti Smith is a brilliant writer, but she says of Warhol, what does she say? Um, I hated the soup and felt little for the cans. And that, that divide, you know, the kind of late Rambodian model of the artist and then the Warholian or neo-Warholian model of the artist really divided New York in the late 1960s and through the, the 1970s. And certainly people like me were on the neo-Warholian side of things, which was all about 
constructed subjects, performative events, um, which you know one could also see that Smith and Mapplethorpe were involved with too. But the the rhetoric of the romantic self in agony or in struggle, um, that and this is to crudify this opposition, but that actually persisted in the 1980s with very different models of the postmodern uh, in art, in architecture, in, in discourse in general. It's part of the divide between, say, the pictures group and the neo-expressionists. Um, and we could reiterate the divide in, in architecture as well. Those had very different propositions about what it was to be a subject what it was to be uh, in, a, in a political situation. And those, those uh, stakes are still very alive for me. Can I just maybe make one? Yeah. Kathy, did you want to? Yeah. Uh, well, as you evoke that, it drifts away a little bit from the, uh, from the you know, psycho-sexual context we've been in. Uh, but I'd just like to, um, you know, put in play the name of David Sally, who uh, became, uh, you know, a, a, a poster child for the neo-expressionist side of that divide you've just evoked, yet was actually one of the chief catalysts for the, um, you know, the, the, the formation of the so-called pictures generation. Uh, friendly with them, bringing sort of lore and procedures from Cal Arts and John Baltasari, um, and sort of seeding it into a discontented group of young artists in New York who then, you know, took it, changed it, ramified it, um, and, you know, remained uh, personally close, say, with Sherry Levine because they were, they were close, you know, you know, uh, collaborators in a way, or, or co-conspirators, it might be better to say. So this is, you know, one of the complications of that moment that really uh, goes against, uh, the, uh, you know, our, our wish to, to uh, more, uh, you know, to uh, more uh, neatly uh, uh, create these divisions. But having said that, I feel I have need to turn things over to Allison, who is a, you must have something to say on the subject, as you are our most accomplished uh, historian on this particular point. You actually s summarized that so well that I don't, I don't, I only want to add to that, you know, to pile on to that and say that some of the reason for the distinction, or for the perceived difference, you know, um, between those two camps in the 80s seem to be, it have something to do with little things like David Sally being represented by Metro Pictures instead of Mary Boone, you know. I mean, oh, well, Metro, I mean, oh, the other way around, sorry. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> the other way, so I've already forgotten. Um, yeah, exactly, and, and that happening, you know. So some, some of these perceived you know, divisions, I, it has to take with a bit of a grain of salt in terms of how they actually evolved, how these perceptions evolved in the first place as, a, 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 you know, warring factions that seem to be a, a, a lot of product of the marketplace as well as criticism and not necessarily what the artists were doing. Could I, um, maybe somebody could respond on this topic to um, the differences in representation or mode, as it were, um, between someone like Cindy Sherman and Eric Fischel, who are both representing women, right? And how do they differ in, in, in that representation? try first because what I have to say is too convoluted. And, and mine is somewhat off topic, so you go first, actually. Oh, convoluted before off topic, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not the best choice. Um, I can't speak to Fischl very well because I think it is really something probably quite different going on there um, because of the, and the reason I think is the structure of the paintings and their sort of whole narrative quality being something very different from the way images or um, 
maybe t uh, I images are framed, you know? It has to, I think, a lot of the way uh, borrowed imagery is framed within works of art, being in, as far as representational modes, the big difference it seems to be that. Um, you know, whether something is being set off as a, uh, a reference to systems of reproduction or not, whether, there, whether there's a reference, you know, to um, the, 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 the uh, media through which imagery comes to us as opposed to just re referring to images. But, but I think that, that, that there's a, a wide range of, of quotational styles going on in the 80s work, and I, I don't know that um, it's so easily, it, I wouldn't separate it into two camps. Maybe there's maybe three or so. I mean, what David Sally is doing is something very different from what Sherry Levine was doing at the same time. But I don't think it's uncritical. I don't know, maybe, maybe if Eric Fischel has a similar relationship to Jack Goldstein or some of the California people and, and instead of that divide, maybe more of the issue would be how do you put, and I think it's a real problem, and maybe it's a ridiculous problem that no one's interested in, but for Mignon and for Bryony, how would you put that t together, if, or would you? Could you put together a, the sort of structural psychoanalytic reading of the image, you know, which I think maybe is what you're asking for a little bit, Ted, and then, and then could you put it together with a, with a socially grounded or more historically, obviously, old-fashioned historical reading? Is there some way that they could be seen or read together? Can I just sort of weigh in on that? Because that's really sort of what I was trying to get at as well, which is, you know, this curious, I think it's fair to say, reemergence of the psychoanalytic in the 80s. And to think about it, sort of what, what's behind that, um, that project. And one of the things that Freud allows us to do is to think difference and sameness. Um, and that's, we've tended, historically, when we think Freud, to privilege difference and to, um, to, to map in all of our, especially in its 80s guises, sort of Freud in terms of difference. But isn't it also the case that Freud allowed us to bespeak sameness in not the old icky way that we used to talk about sameness, but a highly now sort of newly politicized, theorized right recognition that we are both as stupid as it sounds, right? All different and all the same. And didn't that then offer a way into an, a much more sophisticated account of some of these pictures? Am I making sense? Yeah. I mean, I'm still wondering about, you know, the explanatory you know, I'm, I'm, I'm way back in a way, you know, I'm thinking about what it means to claim an explanatory power of, of an idea like that for the interpretation of a picture. And I, I don't mean that glibly, I just mean I, I actually think that, that that's still a kind of problem, that's what makes it interesting. So rather than have the... I never found in psychoanalysis myself the actual theory as it is um, given, as it were, you know, however um, groundbreaking and, and truly important. It wasn't so much that, it was this sense of, you know, the, the coming into being of the subject in some way. Ra and in a way, why I have thought my way out of psychoanalysis in, in some ways the other end is because it never, I, I, it, I think it's always a real problem with all theory, which is the kind of application of it, and which way you think it, where you think it from. So I just can't think it from a problem of difference and sameness. I have to think it from the problem of the image in a way. I just think it's, it's very simple, but that for me is still something that I think you tussle with, with theory. I, you can't kind of do without it, but you can't kind of start from it in that way. I can't start from it in that way. And I think that your example of Just Kids, which I actually love that book as well, is kind of interesting. What kind of object is that? 
you know, that object is something that some of us hate, some of us loved, because in some ways there's a, dis a lack of fit between the Gothic that is being described and the voice that it's being described in, which is spare and something very, I don't know, can only poignant in that lack of fit. But my question would be, what kind of object is that text? It's actually not history in conventional terms. It would normally be called a memoir or be to do with memory. And, you know, in some ways, I think that, you know, it's, I'd love it if we had had that, we were saying last night, as a text, because in a way it does pose <coughs> problems about, you know, what it is. Yeah, and I could even complicate that further by saying I really recommend, even if you've read it, uh, the audiobook, which is read by her. Uh, so it's this confiding voice, uh, uh, you know, so the memory side of it comes across to you uh, with a vividness that's almost, you know, otherwise impossible to duplicate. That, right, that was the only, my original idea was to share... Uh, Rancière on YouTube, which is the way that most people get Rancière, I think. And uh, this is precisely right, is that these non-textual modes of experience are relegated, uh, well, they're not even relegated. It doesn't even occur to us that they might be the primary forms of uh, receiving this information, today at least. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's entirely true uh, during the time frame that we're supposedly analyzing. So. It's the textualization of our discussion is the thing that's most overpowering to me, is that we really do imagine this world of texts sort of fighting it out and advocates for different texts, which no doubt uh, took place, but, but it seems as if there were other things probably happening that um, might, as the Patti Smith sort of, uh, isn't this the strongest opinion we've had yet was on the Patti Smith text? <laughs> so. Uh, okay, no, no, you're, you're denying that you hate it. Okay, all right. I think it was well, Eric Fischel yeah. coming in a right, close right. second. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I just, um, I think you want to open it up to the audience, but I just want to say one thing. I, I don't purport to be a historian of this period, but I think some of you do. And if the historians here of, of the 80s, as we call them, as if it's just a, a show on TV, um, if you cannot distinguish between the art and the project of figures like David Sally and Eric Fischel and Cindy Sherman and Sherry Levine, then I think we're really, really in trouble. Uh, I mean, just to take this, the question of, of sex and violence raised by the Bersani text, there is a way in which Sally very smartly, very cannily stages male fantasies of sexual subjugation. And one can see them and should see them in the same universe of the, the kind of subjection under the gaze that Cindy Sherman stages in her work. I mean, they are in conversation, but aesthetically, politically, they represent very, very different positions. And that was actually part of the extraordinary intensity of that moment. And to say, well, they, you know, it's kind of alike, they look a little bit alike. You can say the same thing about Fischl and, and any other figure on the other side. I don't mean to dichotomize it. There are lots of other positions, lots of other camps. And we can, you know, I'm sure Katie will represent them. But, but I don't think anybody was saying that. Nobody was saying that. Nobody was saying that. I, I got I to gotta say something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just another anecdote, and I know it's cutting in a little bit to the audience time, but. You know, Sherman has said herself on more than one occasion that uh, she happened to uh, come to David Sally's apartment and see that he had on his table a whole bunch of stock photographs or film still type things of the sort of, uh, you know, type that Baldessari regularly collected in Los Angeles where they were a common thrift shop item. Uh, and sort of said, that's kind of interesting, you know, uh, and uh, she, uh, you know, is unabashed in saying that that was uh, the spark that set off this, you know, this revered uh, episode in her own work. So we're not talking about things just sort of vaguely uh, corresponding with another, but talking about where things come from, that, that is meaning, this is an old art language formula, 
you know, that meaning is, uh, 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 is in what a thing is made of. I just want to say briefly, just in, reg in regard to that, and to sort of globalize it rather than, you know, it's interesting as it is to go over those points. I think that one thing has come out over the conversation is the difference between a critical perspective and the difference between a historical perspective. And some people like Kobina Mercer take both and go back and forth between a critical experience in the moment and then trying to take a more historical perspective and, or Hal saying, you know, this is the way Cindy Sherman looked then and this is what has become apparent now, you know, functioning as both a critic and a historian. And it's incredibly valuable when people are willing to do that with their own work as critics. And I think quite unusual to be self-critical and self-reflexive in that way, but also that when we think about different subject positions, we're not just thinking about specific subjects, but about different historical perspectives, and that to value one doesn't necessarily devalue the, the other, and not to be you know, completely relativist about it, but some art matters very deeply at the moment and matters less later, and some differences, you know, for every, that's true for everything, and I think that's something that's gone through all of our discussions and is a particular interest, I think, when you're talking about the recent history of the contemporary, that intersection of criticism and, and history. Yeah, we should, um, yep. can we move to the audience for questions for about 10 minutes before we break for lunch? And I'm sure a lot of these issues will be brought back in our later conversations, especially with the crimp and Krauss text, so. If the 80s were dominated by uh, Freud and Marx, it seems that our age is dominated by uh, Einstein and Christ, and um, as we've sort of wiped out socialism with taking down the Berlin Wall, and um, Freud has also seen better days, um, when do you think we can move beyond Einstein and Christ? <laughs> I'm not sure that seems quite as obvious to the people on the stage as it may seem to you. Uh, what, what, are, what are the predicates attached to, uh, well, the Christ I kind of get with, you know, the, the, the resurgence of fundamentalism. I guess that's probably what you mean, but what about the Einstein side? I, I don't think we're getting less Einsteinian all the time, you well, know. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the question of the value of science is, is on, the, on the plate. And with, um, so it's like we live in these kind of uh, man-made paradigms of this is what our time is about and these are the battles that are occurring. And this is also a construct that we make as we made the socialist, the Marx-Freud construct, which has sort of, you know, moved to the background now. We have a new construct that seems to be, you know, science-based versus religion-based at the moment, which seems absurd the human, to a lot of humanities us. Humanities and the, and the figures that the humanities value and use just dropped out as a middle term, you know, because, you know, it's not making public impact any longer. I wonder whether you were thinking about neuroscience, because obviously the new king on the scene is neuroscience, and obviously the most obvious uh, way that psychoanalysis has been refuted and its validity put in question is that it's absolutely been usurped by the explanatory power of neuroscience and amongst I think psychoanalysis as a profession as well that sense of a kind of loss of faith lack of faith in itself and you know in some ways it's really difficult because obviously there are huge developments in neuroscience as to how the brain works. In some ways though, to follow from that, that therefore psychoanalysis, which after all is founded as a kind of positivist science in the 19th century, it's comparing two different kind of systems of thought. And I think myself, there's a kind of complementarity it doesn't mean that you don't believe in neuroscience and the kind of um, science that may discover things about the brain that we don't know. To think that one needs a mode of inquiry to think about the way humans behave. So 
I think in some ways there, it's a too easy way of dismissing, you know, neuroscience becomes obviously, it's no different from the way science has always been used as a kind of reality principle. And whilst I, I was thinking this when you were talking about reality, Rob, which I actually agree with you about, but I was also thinking about the dangers my anxiety about the dangerous uses to which that word reality is put. And nowhere, you know, one of the most obvious instances is of that is that neuroscience is reality and that this is mythic. And those kind of oppositions are precisely the oppositions that, you know, the whole critical debate that we're interested in kind of tried to break down in the first place. So that seems to me a very conservative um, development. Well, the philosopher Mark Johnson has addressed uh, very recently the, the so-called, you know, science-religion debate or standoff uh, uh, very skeptically and to ask, I think, the devastating question, well, in what way does science, even neuroscience, have an account of consciousness and the consciousness in which the debate lives? And it doesn't. So, you know, you, really, you, re you need another narrative. I would make the distinction between realism and reality, and that I think humanistic discourse is always in the realm of realism. And I think, you know, something like perhaps religion and certainly science aligns itself with reality. And again, to kind of, I think the, the virtue of Latour's formulation of the difference between matters of fact and matters of concern, and that um, that dichotomy is, is a matter of fact that um, we probably won't have much to contribute to, but in, as it gets manifested culturally, it becomes a matter of concern, and that's where we have something to say, I hope. <laughs>